His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King. He's the master of everything. His name is wonderful, Jesus, my Lord. He is the great shepherd, the rock of all Oh, Almighty God, is He? We bow down before Him, and we love and adore Him, for His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, Jesus, because he first loved me. To me, he is so wonderful, and I love him. To me, he so wonderful. Yes, I love him to me. He is so wonderful, and I love him because he first loved me. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. great shepherd, the rock of all ages. Almighty God is he. We bow down before him and we love and
Uh, my mic was off. So again, just want to say thank you, everyone, for joining in. And thank you, Sister Thomas, for reminding us that Jesus is the sweetest name that we know. Uh, today, I'd like to speak to you on the topic, Can God Use Me? Can God Use Me? And it's a backdrop of our theme for the month, God's Possibilities. Uh, we are highlighting, as the world is highlighting on this special Sabbath, um, special needs awareness. And I'm just taking that time to, to just uh, invite you into the world of those who may be going through uh, various challenges, disabilities, special needs, and seeing how this God of possibilities can make room for growth, can make room for wonderful uh, possibilities in their lives. So again, I just want to say thank you for all those who participated so far in our program. And uh, I enjoy just seeing the participation of our youth and young people. So, so Stacy and Pierre, just want to say thank you again. Uh, next month, we're going to be looking at the theme, seeing children as disciples. May is usually uh, a ch dedicated as children's month. And we want to really put a special focus upon them. Uh, they are special to us. And you're going to see more of their faces on our uh, Zoom broadcasts during the month of May. Uh, because we want to let the world know that they are disciples of God. And our job as parents is to ensure that uh, they're growing in the fear and admonition of our Lord. So we want to uh, come next month, celebrate them uh, each week. Can God use me? Let us pray. Lord, even now we thank you for the privilege we have to worship you and adore you. Thank you for that sweet name that you have given to us here under heaven, whereby we can be saved. That name has helped us in difficult and dark times. And that name indeed will bring us to the highest places in the courts of heaven. So Lord, we love that name. And in that name today, we open your word and pray that you will speak to our hearts Encourage someone, I ask, in Christ's name. Amen. So, can God use me? Can God use me? That's a powerful question. And depending on who you ask the question, you will get a different response. Can God use me? What are you worth? In 2008, the Time magazine put in an article uh, by a Stanford economist who said that the average value of a year of quality human life is about $129,000. That's not too bad if you know, you're not making that amount, but they say $129,000. And so basically in a span of a lifetime, uh, some would estimate that you're worth about seven to $9 million. I wish somebody could give me that money up front. But we also know that that's not necessarily the case. Uh, we don't oftentimes work and get that amount of money each day. And even then, is that how much we're actually valued? On a pay scale, there are some CEOs who are getting billions of dollars, while there are other workers who are living on minimum wage and substandard uh, uh, pay. So we're not going to receive or get our value from necessarily going to work and getting uh, a pay. That's not going to uh, share how much we are worth. And you may say, well, I'm in church, so I must be worth something in church. Again, it depends on who you ask. If you ask pastors and elders, deacons, leaders, uh, what's my worth in the church? Sometimes you may hear somebody say, well, it depends what you do in the church. So if you're prominent up there speaking or singing or such, then you're of worth and we know in scripture, that's not the case. That's not how it's supposed to be. Uh, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 21, that the eye cannot look at the hand and say, you're, you're worth nothing, or we don't need you. And the hand cannot look at the feet and say, we don't need you guys. Um, because the Bible is saying every member is, 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 is important to the body. 
And even the ones that we think are weaker, uh, God is saying they are necessary. So, so if you're looking for your worth in people, you may not get the answer that you want. Scripture is kind of highlighting that we need to turn to another source. Now, if you have a disability, and in this world today, there are several individuals with a disability. They say 15% of the world's population have some form of disability. That's about 1 billion individuals. And 110 to 190 million of those have severe disabilities. And so depending on who you ask, if you have a disability, uh, depending on who you ask, you will get a different response. as to say, what am I worth? Sad to say, in this pandemic, I noticed something, and you probably noticed it too, um, people's reaction uh, to the COVID-19. They will say, oh, it only affects those who are older or those with pre-existing condition, as if to say um, their lives don't really matter. If they died, it's because they were already older. I'm sure you've heard that. And it tells you that in some parts of our, of our society, there are people who devalue you based on your age. And if you have some form of disability or pre-existing condition. So again, if you look at this world, you may hold your head down low because there's not much affirmation as to your worth. But we find that if you are looking for your true worth, you have to come to God. Are you useful in society? Yes, you are, but you have to come to God who alone can tell you how much of inestimable worth you are to him and to the universe. We find this in the backdrop of our scripture reading, so eloquently read earlier in Exodus chapter four. But I'm gonna give you the backdrop of this. Uh, you see, Moses came on the scene and uh, Moses had now spent 40 years in the wilderness, uh, looking after sheep, looking after goats, 40 years away from the life he knew back in Egypt. But God wanted to have a conversation with Moses. And one of the first things the Bible says, and it goes back in chapter three earlier on, is that God lit a bush. And that bush was burning, but it wasn't being consumed by the fire. So Moses, this is not necessarily a picture of Midian behind me, as you can see, but you can just imagine, I put it there for just a, a scenery, so you can just imagine that Moses is with the sheep, he's with the goats, and all of a sudden he sees this burning bush. And he, he, God now at that point had or got his attention. And this is what God was trying to do. First, God wanted to have this conversation with Moses to, to share with him his worth, but he had to get Moses' attention. Um, in the book, Messages of, of Healing, page 58, the author shares, when all other voice is hushed, when every, sorry, when every other voice is hushed, and in quietness we wait before him, the silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God, and he bids us be still and know that I am God. So when we are in a, a busy setting. God sometimes has to pull us away from our busyness. And right now, what was consuming Moses' time was the flock in front of him. And God said, I'm, I'm going to take you away from the flock so I can spend some time and share with you the vision I have of you and for others. Sometimes God has to light a, a, a bush like he did for Moses in our lives as well. He has to get our attention some way, somehow. It may be through nature. It may be through someone calling you or something happening in your home. It may be through just various circumstances where God gets your attention. And right now, I can tell you, the world, because of this virus, is on standstill. We're all paused. And God basically has our entire attention. God wants to speak to you. And he wants you to now turn aside. The Bible highlights that when Moses turned aside, God shared with him a few things. We have to remember, we need to now come before him to understand 
our worth. First thing God said to Moses in Exodus 33, Exodus 3, uh, verses 4 and 6, the Bible says, when the Lord saw that he turned aside. Remember, you have to turn to God as well. He's trying to get your attention. But the Bible says, when Moses turned aside to, to see him, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. Now, that is significant. If you're wondering, am I valuable? Am I somebody? Understand, you're in the presence of God who knows your name. Now, is that significant? Uh, there are, let me just say, we're in the Milky Way galaxy. Planet Earth is a part of the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, and there are 30 to 50 billion suns in our galaxy. Listen to me now. 30 to 50 billion suns in our galaxy. God knows the name of each of those suns. But scientists are able to look up and count about a hundred billion galaxies. Can you imagine how many billions of suns are part of those galaxies? And God knows the name of each of them. And here we, we have a revelation that God also knows your name. So not only does he have an infinite capacity to remember things, he takes great care in knowing his children. And he knows your name. And then God says to Moses, not only that, Moses, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But hold on. Those are, those are people who have died a long time ago. And God is revealing to not only Moses, but to us, that even if you have passed away from the scene of this earth, you are still important and valuable to him. You could be dead. Think about that. You may be dead six feet in the grave, but God still holds on to your memory. He still holds on to you because you are precious to him. So this is remarkable. God is saying you are precious. Now, at this point, um, Moses is, wow, he's odd. He's in the presence of God. But this man, Moses, has been living in a strange land strange culture, strange tradi traditions. He even names his son Gershom, uh, a name that says stranger in a strange land. So for Moses, he's just out of place. He feels out of place. And maybe today you're feeling out of place. Maybe you don't feel like you have value. And this is where I invite you to come into God's presence. God is now inviting Moses, this man who feels like a stranger, this man who for 40 years is walking with depression. His heart is broken. He has felt a uh, sting of rejection. And God brings him into his presence to share with him something powerful about Moses and about how much God loves him. And here now, you, you think that God is going to spend a lot of time on Moses' feelings. Remember, Moses is feeling depressed. Moses is feeling anxious. Moses just feels, you know, that's it. I, I have no use or no value. I'm now a shepherd. Uh, you know, I'm not even really getting paid much for this work. There's not much value to what I am doing. But listen to what God does. The first thing God says to Moses is, I have a burden. The cries of the people in Egypt, the Israelites, have come out to me. Uh, I have a burden, Moses, and I want to share that burden with you. I want you, Moses, to feel what others are going through. What is that called? It's called empathy. The ability to understand and share the feelings of others. Now, this goes beyond any personal issue. So whether you have a disability or not, God is saying, I want you now to connect and to feel what someone else is feeling. Turn to your right, turn to your left, and consider what your neighbor is going through. The Israelites, we know, were suffering. And church family, uh, I want you to know that there are people in our congregation, people who are watching live right now, people in this world, who have special needs and disabilities who are hurting. Do we hurt with them? Are we able to empathize with them? God came to Moses and said, I have seen, I have heard, 
the burden that they have is upon my heart. And Moses, I'm here to share that burden with you. Are you able to feel what they're going through as well? Now, we find that there are several individuals with physical disabilities, maybe wheelchair bound, they may have uh, sociological, sensory issues, psychological, physical, whatever the issues may be. There are several issues out there. But I want to, you to draw into their experience. Why is God doing this at this point? Why didn't God just start with uh, how Moses is feeling? Why does he start with how others are feeling? You see, God is trying to help Moses to value his neighbors. He's now far removed from the Israelites, but God is still saying to him, I value them. And I want you to feel what they're feeling, even though you're miles away from them. Even though you're not able today to worship together in one location, I want you to feel how the wider membership is feeling because they, the burdens they have is upon my heart and I want you to have it too. And God also wants Moses to appreciate them, to appreciate the Israelites for who they are. And he wants us to appreciate others for who they are. Quick lessons on this. Uh, Jesus, we know, left heaven because there was a burden on his heart for humanity. And so though Jesus was miles separated from us, his mind was still weighed down with the cares of his people on earth. There's also another thing to, this is one of the reasons why we, we give or return our tithes and offering. When we return our tithe, we're returning it not because we know who the money is going to, uh, because obviously for our church system, the tithe goes all the way to the top and circulates around the world. Yes, it comes to a local conference as well. But we give because we're hoping that someone is benefited at the end. God is teaching us to, to give and to, to sympathize and to empathize with others who we don't even see. You don't have to see people in order to empathize with them. And God wanted Moses to empathize though he was miles away from Egypt and miles away from where his people were. So Moses is now silent. He has nothing to say about his own lot in life. God is now taking the attention from his own insecurities to those outside. But then God comes back to Moses and now he desires to work on his self-esteem. You see, in order to love your neighbor, Jesus says you have to love yourself. And this is not a love yourself, which says with pride, I'm just going to, you know, just treat myself. No, this is the love that says, I appreciate who I am. I appreciate the fact that God made me special, that God made me with my abilities and sometimes inabilities. I appreciate who I am in the presence of God. And God says, I'm going to have to teach you now, Moses, to appreciate who you are. We need a healthy self-esteem, and God becomes a mighty counselor in Moses' life. So God says it to Moses in uh, Exodus chapter 4 and verse 2. God says to him, Moses, what is that in your hand? What is that in your hand? In essence, Moses, I'm going to pause and allow you to count your blessings right now. For Moses... All he saw was a, a piece of dumb stick, a dumb rod in his hand. And this was a stick that he was using to, to help lead the flock of goats and sheep, a, a stick that would protect them from wolves or any vicious animals that would come. And all it was to him was a dumb piece of wood. Big deal. But look what happened. As God says, I want you now to count your blessing. Look what happened in one minute. In one minute, God revealed the power of that rod when submitted in his hands, in God's control. In one minute, after God said, I want you to throw down that rod, let me tell you, Moses never looked at that rod the same way again. 
sometimes the things that we have before us, when God is saying, I want you to count that as a blessing, we're like, but this is silly. This is nothing. All it is is this. All it is is whatever. And God says, listen, just bring it to me. And I want to show you how valuable that little thing is in my hands. And believe me, that was a lesson for Moses. Sometimes we have been sitting on our voice, sitting on our hands, sitting on our feet, sitting on our skills, sitting on our influence and sitting on our gifts, not knowing their true worth, not knowing how golden it is, the things that we have. In one minute, Moses realized he was holding something that could change the course of history, that could change the course of life for thousands of people. And don't get me wrong, this wasn't a fluke. When Jesus came on this earth uh, and was choosing his disciples, he chose simple individuals and he took what they were good at, fishing, and made them some of the greatest soul winners, the greatest fishers of men the world has ever known. And if you ask Peter then, he would say, all I am is a fisherman, nothing big, no big deal about that. But Jesus said, I'm going to take that and I'm going to do something with it that will transform this world. This is how God works with us. He looks at what we have and he says, have you really given thanks about that? Oh, you don't think it's special. Let me show you how special it is. God can take you, yes, you with your disabilities and create abilities that you never dreamed of. For that is the God whom we serve. Next, God was going to work on Moses' fears. You know, um, the reason we sometimes fail to progress in life is because of fear. Fear of the known and fear of the unknown. One author says, to be free from all fear, we must have but one fear, the fear of God. I repeat, to be free from all fear, we must have but one fear, the fear of God. So Moses, God said to Moses, throw down your rod, Moses. And Moses did, and it turned into a, a, a serpent, a snake. And immediately Moses, the Bible said, ran from it because Moses was afraid of snakes. And I don't blame him. I'm afraid of snakes too. Moses was afraid, and he ran from the snake. And here God was going to uh, highlight, that. Moses, I want you to confront your fear right now. <coughs> I want you to confront your fear at this point, Moses. And so God said to him, Moses, pick up that serpent by the tail. Here's a rule, friends. Never pick up a snake by the tail. That's the worst place to pick it up. It will turn around and strike you. But here God was pushing Moses to look his fear in the eyes and grasp that fear and overcome it. What is God trying to do here? The serpent also we know symbolized in scripture represents Satan. And in this world, we will have to deal with sin. We will have to deal with Satan and his angels. And God is saying, I don't want you to fear Satan. I don't want you to go in your Christian journey thinking, oh, the devil is against me. I don't want you to boast about Satan's power. I want you to boast about my power in your life. So grab that old weasel by the tail and understand that serpent has no mastery over you. One application we can bring from that. But here we're saying you have to learn to trust in God. Secondly, God said to Moses, put your hand in your, in your cloak and take it back out. And when Moses did that, it turned white as leprosy. It was just, his hand was just now leprous and with all manner of illness upon it, boils and everything was there. And Moses became afraid because Moses, you see, was afraid of sickness and death. No one likes sickness. We all have that as a fear. You can see what's happening with the COVID virus outside. We don't want that virus. And God was now saying, listen, listen, Moses, I have power over sickness and I have power over death. That's one of your fears. I want you to understand that I have 
power over life and death. Moses, you need not fear. Saints of God, God is addressing our fears. And then God said, I want you, when you go to do another thing, and it'll be a miracle, just take some water from the river, empty it out before the Israelites, and it's going to turn to blood. And I wish I had time to elaborate on this some more, because when I think about Jesus on the cross, when they pierced his side, blood and water poured out. And this is the first time we're seeing the blood and water in Scripture coming together. But, but, but this may illustrate change. The water turned into blood. Oftentimes, we are afraid of change in our lives. This may be the fear that hinders us the most. Because for Moses, what God was going to call him to do was to change his life and to change his lifestyle. No longer a shepherd, now he's going to be leading millions of people. That's a big change. You may be uh, disabled for some, uh, you may have a disability and you're saying, God, you're pushing me into the spotlight. You know I'm shy. God, you're, you, you, you know I have this uh, disability and, and you're gonna make me go before a crowd. You're gonna make me minister to my neighbor. I don't want anyone to see me, God. And God says, I know you have the fear of change, but I want you to understand that even if it is in the water or in the blood, listen, I am with you. And we understand that the water and the blood, they can transform. You're, you're, you're baptized in water and, and in even communion, that wine symbolizes the blood of Christ, which changes you for the better. God says, I want to change you. Don't be afraid of the change I'm going to bring in you. Now, there was something else that Moses wrestled with, and it came up in verse 10. Moses said, Lord, I'm not eloquent. I, I, I don't speak very well. Never before, not after. And some authors, commentators have said, well, this was just his way of, of showing that he's humble. Um, while others have highlighted that, listen, um, rejection can do that to you. Uh, you may have been a person who is outgoing and, 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 and willing to talk, but if you've been through a major rejection, you may become close. You may become shy, fearful of speaking because of what happened. And you may have like PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, because of what happened in yesteryear. And you're afraid to go forth. Moses was rejected by the people, and that rejection ran deep inside of him. And now he hasn't spoken uh, the Egyptian language in 40 years. He cares not to speak it. He cares not. He's trying to unlearn his past because he doesn't want to confront it. And here God is saying, I want you to go and speak before them. And Moses is doubting himself. But here, this quote from John Whittier, John Whittier writes, the saddest words of tongue or pen may well be, it might have been. Especially silence left unbroken and healing words we might have spoken. Can you imagine if Moses allowed his fear of rejection to get the better of him? If that was the case, then we wouldn't read of this mighty deliverance. If that was the case, we wouldn't read anything in the first five books of the Bible because Moses wrote those first five books, the Pentateuch. Had Moses allowed a fear of rejection to get the better of him, my brothers and sisters, thousands, and in fact, millions of people would, would have been left in Egypt because of his fear. And God said to him, listen, Moses, I am the one who created your mouth. I'm the one who creates eyes. I'm the one who creates the mouths and the ears and everything about you. You don't have to worry. I will be with you whether it is functioning or not. I will put words in your mouth. You just have to understand I am with you. And quickly, God now did something powerful because he's speaking to Moses, but, and he's building up Moses' self-esteem. But the three miracles that God performed with Moses, God now was going to do it to prepare the people to receive Moses. You see, God is also preparing the grounds for you. So while God gave Moses these miracles to help him overcome his fears, these miracles were going to be used to help the Israelites overcome their fear and bias of Moses. 
They were afraid of Moses. They didn't trust Moses. They had rejected him before. And sometimes individuals who are living with disabilities know the feeling of rejection because sometimes their church has rejected them. Their church has said, no, you're not healthy enough. You're not good enough to do this or that. You don't have the eloquence enough to do this or that. You don't have the ability to come on the platform. You don't have the ability to, to write. You don't have the ability. And so they have felt rejection time and time again. So God God says, I have to prepare the people for you as well. So Moses went to them and showed them the same three miracles. And sure enough, the Bible says that they accepted him. God knew they would accept him because of those miracles. But now they accepted him because God was at work. So, so for those who are experiencing that rejection, I want you to understand, be patient with others. Be patient with your church. It took 40 years for the people to accept Moses. 40 years for them to accept who he was, for them to accept that he was going to be a leader used by God. 40 years. So please don't just expect change in six months or one year, but pray that God will work upon the hearts of those around. And secondly, allow God the room and space to do the convincing. He's the one who did them perform the miracles. He only needed Moses to be obedient. So let God move. Let God work. But if he asks you, if he's calling you to do something in the church or do something in the community, just be obedient. But let God work the miracles that will convince and change the hearts of men and women. And lastly, be sure to give God the praise. Let all the praise and worship go to God. The Bible says in verse 31 that the people believed. They now believe. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked on their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. They worshipped God, not Moses. So understand, when God does something through you, they are not worshiping you. And you must never take that praise. That doesn't belong to you. That belongs to God. Um, I stand here as a living example. Um, and for those who know me way back from Hackensack, New Jersey and such, you remember me as that shy young boy in church. Um, and when God says, I want you now to go and, and preach the gospel, I said, there is no way, God, that that is possible. But through my experience, going through that point of praying and agonizing with God and, and trusting in God, I have seen him work miracles in my life. Now, can I come up here and say that it is by my eloquence? No way because I know the deal. I know my history with God. And I know that every good thing that comes from this little preacher um, comes from above. The praise goes to God. And that must be the way we handle ourselves. Whether you have a disability and God says, I'm going to turn that into a possibility. I'm going to show the world what I can do. Remember to give God the praise. So in conclusion today, I want to share with you, if God is getting your attention, talk to him. He's going to call you like he did Moses. He's going to say, please, just turn the remote off for a minute. I want to talk to you today. Before you go on Facebook, before you go on all the Instagram, before you do all of that, I want to spend some time with you because I want to show you how much you're worth to me. Spend time with God. Secondly, understand that God loves you with an everlasting love. He knows everything about you. So yes, you may point to your insecurities and disabilities, but God says beyond all of that, I love you. Whether you are cognitive, whether you're in a coma, whether you're on bed, I love you, God says. I have loved you with an everlasting love. And then God wants you to share his burden for others. So when God reveals the burden that he has for your neighbors, for your family, for your friends, embrace that because God has given you a shared vision and a shared burden. He wants you to have empathy for others. Please allow him then to strengthen your self-esteem by being thankful for the things you have. Don't worry about your neighbors. 
Don't worry about what gifts somebody else may have. Don't worry about their abilities or your disability. Just give him thanks for what you have. Look around you. Give thanks for your family. Give thanks for your friends. Give thanks for your loved ones. Just give thanks for your, your abilities and your talents. Give him thanks. And know, finally, that God, God's will for your life uh, will be met. Know that nothing can prevent God's plan for your life to come, in, to, to, come to pass once you trust him. God's will will come to pass. God wanted Moses to go and deliver his people. And all Moses had to do was accept. And God said, I will do the rest. Today, if you have a disability, God is saying, I just want you to trust me. I will do the rest. And church family, I speak to you. We have to do more. And I'm speaking of myself. We have to do more to embrace others with special needs with disabilities, I don't think God is going to come on this earth until the church fully matures in the way we embrace those with disabilities. He tried to show it by example while he was here on this earth. He called the lepers, he called the disabled to come to him, and they came. This is a time, too, where the church must call individuals with all sorts of disabilities to come because God desires to use them as well. And so if it is your desire, if it is your desire, the, our guest speaker last week did something powerful in the appeal, and I want to continue that. If it is your desire to say, God, I want to submit my life to you, that you, Lord, will use me to your glory and honor. You can just write submit. If you're on the Zoom chat, write submit. If you're on Facebook, just write submit. I am here to submit my life to you. I'm here to submit. Praise be to God. I'm going to pray a special prayer because we're all submitting ourselves to him today. And I pray that today as we go through this week, that we will see God miraculously at work in our lives. I too am submitting afresh to my God. Let us pray. Lord, I just want to pause and say thank you for the ability we have to come and to spend time with you. Lord, as you did with Moses, you just wanted him to turn aside for a little bit with you. Just a few moments with you transformed his life. So Lord, amidst the busyness of our life, yes, we may have children. Yes, we may have a job. Yes, we may have chores to do. Help us to pause and find time to spend with you. It's the only way we will know how much we're truly worth. And so, Lord, I pray that the value and estimation that you have upon us will be fully realized as well. You have given us the opportunity to give you thanks for what we have, but oftentimes we complain for what we don't have. Moses did not have a, a fancy chariot. He did not have a wonderful and luxurious mansion but you, he had a rod in his hand. Little did he know that that rod could part the Red Sea. Little did he know the rod could humble the pride of Pharaoh, but you knew. And so, Lord, I pray for each person watching this program today. They too have rods in their hands. They have something, a gift, a talent that you have given to them. Sometimes it is hidden, but today, Lord, I'm praying that you will shake off the dust and allow them to see that article or that gift of value in their possession and allow them, Lord, to have a wonderful and a healthy self-esteem. The devil is whispering in our ears, we're no good. But Lord, we are dismissing that rascal right now. Satan has no power over us. We are of value. Because you have said, oh Lord, you have loved us with an everlasting love. So please, with that assurance, help us to stand with the pride that says, I am a son, I am a daughter of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Grant us, Lord, a healthy self-esteem. And then, Lord, help us to truly love others as well. Help us to care for them. 
There are those around us who are suffering and struggling, those who simply need a phone call from us, those who will be benefited by some food that we can drop off, those, oh Lord, who can just be encouraged by something that we give to them. So, Lord, please lay upon us the burden you have for others so that we too can share that burden. And as each person today has said and pledged, we submit to you. Lord, we love you, and we submit to your Holy Spirit's leading in our lives. However you desire to lead us, Lord, whatever change you have in our lives, we will trust and obey, because there is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and, to, and obey. So, Lord, we thank you, and we bless your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. I do pray that uh, you have been blessed. And I just want to, again, say thank you for all those who have come on our Zoom, as well as our, our Facebook setting. Um, it's such a privilege and a pleasure. Uh, and just before we go, I'm going to say that we're going to look at a way for us as members uh, to connect. And we want to maybe find a way that we can share what's going on. Uh, in a little bit more of a private setting. So we're going to be praying about that, how to do so. Um, but we want to connect a little bit deeper away from the live. But we believe that God uh, is in control and we are going to continue the sweet fellowship that we have. So may God continue to bless and keep you. Come back again at 3 for Bible class. Take care and be blessed. Take care, Elder Hunter, <laughs> Dr. Ricketts, God bless, Sister Luann, and Mani, Morgan, blessings, Sister Judy, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Sister Tamara, amen. God bless you. Brother Tom, God bless. Take care now. Amen, Sister Luann. God bless, Elder Shokai. And uh, Sister Niza, all right, Nisa Zulu, uh, thank you for worshiping with us. Uh, thank you for joining and uh, praying God's richest blessings. Uh, take care, everybody. Bye. Amen. Take care, Sister Marcia. Okay, bye-bye. Amen. God bless now. <laughs>